I'd like to take a quick moment also to introduce and thank our expert panel. We could not make these events happen without the generous donation of time and expertise from the experts who come in for our panel today. So thank you everybody for being here. We're going to start with Ms. Lori Chapkin. So uh, Lori is coordinator of the Career Development Center here at Johnson County Community College. As a first generation college student who did not have access to any career services, she enjoys helping students find out more about themselves and explain how to use that information to make educated decisions in choosing a major or career. Lori feels that her previous counseling experience and work as a special education teacher have prepared her well for her work in career development. She finds it very fulfilling to cultivate the potential in students and help them to see their best selves. Uh, Lori holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Sociology and Psychology from Adrian College, a Master of Education degree from DePaul University, and a Master of Arts in Counseling from Northeastern Illinois University. Please welcome Lori. Uh, our second member of the guest panel is Keely J. Snyder. Keely is Executive Director of Workforce Partnership, the local workforce development board for Johnson, Wyandotte, and Leavenworth counties here in Kansas. She directs federal and state funds for workforce development programs for adults and youth, including classroom training, on-the-job training, and other work-based learning experiences. Prior to the, uh, assuming the role of executive director in 2016, Keeley served as associate director for the Civic Council of Greater Kansas City. There she directed all human capital development initiatives, including both higher education and workforce, as well as directed the Civic Council's Kansas City Tomorrow Leadership Program. Uh, Ms. Schneider uh, began her second career in nonprofit over nine years ago as the development director for a charter school serving at-risk youth in Casey Moe, before making the leap to nonprofit. She practiced law in the areas of transactional and regulatory health care and commercial real estate. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science, magna cum laude, from Davidson College, and earned her JD at the University of Georgia. Please welcome Keeley. Uh, and finally, returning to Colab Talk, we have Mr. Mike Souter. Mike is the Dean of Continuing Education here at Johnson County Community College, um, serving more than 15,000 students each year. JCCC Continuing Ed covers computer technology, business management, leadership, healthcare, transportation, skilled trades, adult basic education and development, and manufacturing. His previous experience includes military operations, research and develop, and manufacturing. His 20 years of military service includes command and staff assignments in the 1st Infantry, Infantry and 3rd Armored Divisions, management of futuristic research and development projects, and oversight of the manufacture of an armored vehicle. After the Army, he spent eight years leading cross-functional teams for a publicly traded company in a high-volume manufacturing facility that did, eight, that did $850 million in sales each year. His education includes a Bachelor of Science from the United States Military Academy at West Point and a Master of Science from the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. Please welcome Mike. So our topic today is looking at uh, the changing um, workforce in the 21st century uh, workforce needs. And so we're going to start that conversation. Um, to give us a little food for thought before we engage with our expert panel, we're going to start with a TED Talk from Dr. Andrew McAfee, who is a principal research scientist with the MIT Sloan School of, Ma of uh, Management. Dr. McAfee was also a former professor at Harvard Business School, uh, and he is currently co-director of the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy. Dr. McAfee holds a Doctor of Business Administration from Harvard and then four, count them, four degrees from MIT. Uh, double master's degrees in mechanical engineering and management. Um, and then for some reason I found this really interesting that his first bachelor's degree was in humanities with an emphasis in French as well as uh, engineering. So we'll start with our TED Talk where um, Dr. McAfee is going to talk about um, the changes and evolution of the workforce needs that he sees coming over the next couple of decades. So we'll use that as our food for thought, and then we'll dump, dive in from there. Now, I feel compelled to point out at this point that um, Dr. McAfee made that TED Talk in 2013. Um, now that we're in 2019, I don't know that I've heard of any of our Congress people going to rides in autonomous cars. I don't know. So, so, this, so it's still certainly relevant, but um, I wonder if folks have any thoughts or, or rather reactions. That was one of my first thoughts. I thought, huh, it's a good idea, but I don't know that we're there yet. Any other thoughts or reactions that folks have before we go into our discussion questions? Yes, sir. I think we have a lot of great technology, but it's not necessarily implemented here in North America. Um, as far as like the checks and how they were sent to banks and how they were 
collided and you know through planes and 9/11 kind of changed that and had to we had to resolve and find a solution. Mm -hmm. So now you have where you can just snap a picture on your banking app and transact your checks and you know they don't need to flight these through a clearinghouse or all that anymore. So um, sometimes I just feel like we're a little delayed in adapting what we already have in development or or maybe finding a use for it. So taking some of our innovation and making it practical yeah. and accessible and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's a fair point. Um, there's a long history, I think, in the United States of innovation that starts out as a very small private thing. You know, what was the internet started as? Um, but purely a military communication tool. Um, so yes, yeah, figuring out how do we take stuff that we've innovated and make it accessible. That's a good point. Other thoughts? Any reactions from our panel before we move on? Well, I, I, I agree with you. It, it's, it's interesting. I happened to, I don't know, several months ago, right? Yeah. Grab oh, your mic, Keely. So sorry. <laughs> Forgot about the mic. Thank you. No, I, I agree with you that this, this vision of, you know, the robots taking all of our jobs, um, it's coming, yes. We're not there. It's going to be a while. And the short-term play, in my view, is we have to put, a, put people out in the workforce who understand how to work alongside robots, to work with the technology, to be adaptable when the new technology comes, to understand that. So for a while here, because think about it, autonomous cars is a perfect example. We're not going to wake up one day and suddenly We've changed over from gas cars that we have to drive to all of these electric vehicles that are completely self-driving. It's not going to happen. We are going to have years and years and years of both autonomous and you know, vehicles that we have to drive on the road at the same time. And I think to me, if you t translate that into a manufacturing facility or any kind of workplace, for a long time, we're going to have this sort of clashing almost uh, between robot, human, AI, human. And that to me is going to take on our part as, as the humans, uh, this need for more adaptability, flexibility in our thinking. How do we shift how we work? It's not just, well, what has to get done, but how do we get the work done now in a better way with this technology, without this old technology? Those, to me, are the interesting things in that short term. So that would be kind of one of my mm -hmm. immediate reactions. Mike or Lori, anything you want to add? Thank you, Keely. I would just add that um, he kind of predicts, has a dire prediction about this great loss of jobs. And um, I was just doing some research in uh, the World Economic Forum Future of Jobs reports actually predicts a growth in jobs. It's just different types of jobs. So we'll lose 75 million jobs, but we'll actually gain 133 million by 2022 that are different types of jobs, but we can go into the, that later, so. Great, thank you, Lori. And Mike, did you want to add anything? <laughs> I noticed the same thing, that it was from 2013 and you know we still have truck drivers and, and a lot of things going on and there has been some jobs that have been replaced you know you hear about Walmart you know the checkout people are gone and now we got self check and all that but I, I thought it you know he clearly had a lot to say and tried to say it in a short amount of time and he was a little all over the map I think combined trying to combine the economics and the social issues that I weren't sure is that connected but obviously there are connections between economics and social issues but I thought it was really um, curious that he sort of closed with how important the truth was and then I'll go with what Lori said is I think when you start being showing a little hyperbole with these predictions that you make trying to scare people to death I don't necessarily think that's the truth in 2013 and maybe if you're an activist and want to make things try to happen that's the approach you take um, but you know what we've seen now by you know we do have the benefit of 2020 hindsight that he didn't have in 2013 or, or 2019 is that wow you know uh, it, it, all that wasn't as bad as he predicted Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that change is coming, but I think to Keeley's point of it's going to be a very slow dual process or multi-lane process where we have multiple systems and tools going on at the same time. I mean, think about you know how long we've had um, advanced and cellular technology, but how we different times of phone service you still have available, right? So 
Um, so yeah, I think that's a, a good point that um, we are often, particularly in news, we'll look at it as if it's a dichotomy of, oh, suddenly everything's going to stop tomorrow. What are we going to do? But it is going to be a much slower uh, transition, which in some ways adds time for us and also adds challenges um, in terms of how do we make this transition. Maybe, so, you know, to your point, mm -hmm. the, the the largest percentage of funds that I spend right now and put three people through a short-term training, mm -hmm. commercial truck driver, and here we are looking at the verge of automated vehicles, and yet that is still my number one vacancy mm -hmm. in this three-county region, and I can put those people to work in eight weeks. You sure. know, so so it's. It is blended. Yeah. yeah. So actually, that's a great lead into our next, uh, our first discussion question here. Um, and so let's let's stick with trucking. Um, so um, trucking is one of those fields that's, of course, projected to have a massive drop in employment over the next 20 years. Um, at the same time, though, to, to Keeley's point, of course, we train folks here with their CDLs here at the college. Um, it's a popular program. Uh, it's one of the field, one of the few fields, really, without a high school, without a more than a high school education and the specific license, you can go out and make a pretty good uh, living. And median income is forty-two thousand dollars for truck drivers. So it's this interesting. Uh, okay, yeah, the need right now is huge, but um, long term. How do we help those folks be flexible, adaptable, that kind of thing? So I wonder about, and my question for the group here is that knowing that these changes are coming, how do we make sure, well, first of all, this kind of gets to the social question. First of all, is there a responsibility to make sure that the benefits are distributed equally? Um, and if so, how, how might we do that? Given that we need, you know, we need whoever this is to drive his truck today, um, but maybe 10 years from now, how do we help him transition? So. Yeah, Lori. Okay, so um, I agree a little bit with Mike about how his combination of the social issues versus the economic with maybe was a little heavy-handed. Mm -hmm. um, the inner socialist in me did like the idea of the universal minimum income, but um, I think really where the responsibility comes is with companies. Mm -hmm. And right now the imbalance of pay with CEOs and then um, the other workers is um, at an all-time high and really where that money should be going is retraining so as a company progresses and knows that their those jobs are going to be going to m machines are becoming more automated it should be the responsibility of companies to r train their employees for jobs that are on the horizon mm -hmm. and um, I think that Sadly, most of the time, what incentivizes companies is uh, money. And so it might be, as a country, uh, an idea, good idea f to uh, financially incentivize companies to train their workers so that they are prepared. And we all benefit then, if, we all, if we're looking at that social perspective, from uh, having a educated and employed workforce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, want to note, that, so there's important questions there about, okay, who's investing in workforce development and how, and how is that investment happening, right? Um, and how are we making most, most efficient use of the funds and resources we have available to, in order to, to support the most people? And I think you raise an important question. We hear a lot about like corporate citizenship. What does that look like? Um, and I think that's an important element of, okay, how is the company not just contributing to their shareholders or profit, uh, short-term returns, but what's the long-term investment? Yeah, good point. Thank you, Lori. I think you both were reading and cheating off of my notes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, as to this question, like, whose responsibility is this, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I am one of those, you know, just probably died in the wool, like, you have personal responsibility, right? And so I do believe there is both. Mm -hmm. Yes, we as individuals have the responsibility to be aware of what's going on in our world and know that, wow, automated vehicles, I'm a truck driver, what does that look like for me 10 years from now, five years from now, whatever that is? So yes, there is that, you you at least have to have the drive to, to say, I want to further my skills, I want to develop something new or different, and there, no amount of money that the public workforce system puts in, no amount of money that a private company would put into your training is going to do any bit of good if that person is not taking that personal uh, step to say, I want this for myself. So I, I think in a way that's sort of like understood, you know, you have to at least mm -hmm. say that. But as far as sort of the, um, 
the, the whose responsibility to maybe upskill or train or retrain. The difficulty there is there are a lot of people who may want to and have the capability intellectually to do so but they do not have the opportunity to do so. And so that I think is, is best sort of uh, you know, brought together in this concept of th that talent is universal, but opportunity isn't. And that's where the public workforce system and the private sector must come together to help solve that. And so public sector, there's so many things we could do with some of the dollars that are even already out there to loosen them up and not have them so heavily regulated in a way that prevents some of the training dollars to go here or there, they must go here. Perfect example that you guys are probably familiar with is Pell Grant. Okay, Pell Grant, great, except that Pell Grant can't be used for short-term training. If someone just needs a short-term training, they can't access their Pell Grant for that. That's silly. And that's one of the things that I know right now, as far as advocacy on the federal level, is being looked at really hard. So those are, that's just one example. Um, but the other, just like you said, that was exactly what I wrote, was while private sector has to figure out for themselves and their own workforce, what does our workforce look like 10 years from now, 20 years from now, they're the ones who know what they're gonna be purchasing in terms of technology, what they're shifting to. Any decent company is gonna be making strategic plans that are long-term. And they know what that most likely will look like. They have a responsibility to then map out what that career pathway is gonna look like for their current employees. I'm not even talking about the new hires, the current employees. So I think that is a real responsibility to invest mm -hmm. that way. Right. Thank you, Keely. And I, I want to highlight, I think some of the things you're, you're pointing out there is that this challenge is really going to take a partnership of, of individuals being willing to engage, but also public and private entities of, okay, how are we all working together? Um, so yeah, it has to be a team effort. And that, to your point, um, that individual drive, um, which maybe goes to something about our educational culture, this idea of you go to school until you're whatever age and then you're done, right? That's kind of our norm. Um, you know, how many students that I hear every day going, boy, if I just get through these classes and then I can go on with the rest of my life. You know? <laughs> right, so and that's, that goes to us, so they're all related. We have economics, we have social, we have cultural issues that are all tied into to this challenge. So Mike, did you have a comment? Uh, yeah, I think we pretty much hit it. When uh, my first question when I read that was, you know, who is the we in this statement? I mean, is that we the individual? Is that we the parents? Is that we the educational system K through 12 or the college? Is that we the city, local, county, federal government? You know, is it the companies? You know, who is the we? Um, I'm also a strong believer in, uh, I guess it was closer aligned with the Abraham Lincoln quote in the people. I think we will continue to evolve as a species. Um, we have for a long time now. And I think the key it's, and especially being a, you know, he, he, we used uh, Milton Friedman up there, which is an MIT guy, and that guy's an MIT grad. You know, the simplest of economic concepts is, is that you're going to be paid based on the value that you provide. Um, and if you can be replaced by a machine, you're probably not adding that much value to the system. And the key to adding more value is to continue to learn either on the job or through, you know, education and things that you do. Uh, to put, I, I think it's highly unfair to put it on the back of, too many others for a person to evolve where they need to evolve to and not pay, a, pay attention to what's going on. Ha spent eight years in high volume manufacturing and we brought in some robotics and really did not see jobs go down. What we saw was different kinds of jobs. We needed all these programmers to program these machines and keep them going and things like that. You know, I heard a really interesting concept not too long ago and it's how most of us in this room are application users and a projection of what's going to be in the, in the future is most of us when we come through the school system will be programmers. And you won't really be having applications. You'll be constantly creating programs to do the things that you need to do that your applications do for you today. Well, I'm not a programmer. I'm not there. But I'm hoping those that follow us will evolve if that's truly the thing. And I think they will. Um, but I, I, I think it's a matter of people just need to evolve and adapt as these changes come into place and, and keep that concept. If you, if you want to be more like Ted and less like Bill, you need to find ways to add more value. I heard a Zig Ziglar thing that was funny as heck. Zig Ziglar was a sales guy. And a young man was telling Zig that he needed to change jobs. And he said, well, why? He goes, well, they, they don't pay anything here. 
He goes, what do you mean they don't pay anything here? Well, they don't pay anything here. I'll show you my paycheck. And Zig said, no, that's what they pay you. You know, <laughs> do you think the marketing guy gets paid that or the, you know, the chief accountant gets paid that? No, that's, that's what they pay you, you know. And it's the same thing. And I get the CEO spread. And it's like the argument of the $10 million quarterback in the NFL. Yeah, we might all hate that. But the fact is the guy adds so much value. We may not think so if you're not into sports. But let me tell you, the gazillion of people that are buying tickets and tuning into those games is why that guy makes $10 million because of all the advertisers and stuff it draws. So we may hate it. And if you really do, don't watch it. And pretty soon, if nobody watched it, he wouldn't be adding value and he wouldn't make $10 million. But the fact is, he adds a value. And if you really don't like it, you go learn to throw that, you know, bullet of a football 60 yards right on target while 350-pound defensive guys coming down on you, and then you can go make 10 million a year. I think, uh, thank you, Mike, and I think that gets to an important point about the distribution of opportunity and who has the opportunity to pursue education. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot we could we could unpack there, but um, there's. Um, it's a combination, yeah, certainly of, of personal responsibility, but also who has access to what opportunity. Um, and I guess when I get to that comment, you know, I want to point out, for example, that there are uh, that we're all white people in this room right now. Um, so the challenge is, if you're a person of color, of getting to an educational institution, of be getting programming training. You know, so there are cultural and social issues that are impacting people's access to opportunity as well. So we don't want to forget that. We have a quick comment back here. I'm a nurse, and I've been a nurse for a few years, and um, I too, like Lori, um, first generation to go to college and came from a poverty-stricken family in New Orleans, um, very manual labor, blue collar, white collar. Um, you know, those jobs have kind of subsided to where back then in the day, my grandparents made a substantial living uh, doing that. Um, and uh, the biggest hurdle for me was I had to have that huge drive to work sometimes four jobs while going to school to attain the level that I got. Now we see this huge shortage, let's say, in my industry where good luck in the next, so it's already at that point where I'm going to have to tell a patient to go help their other patient because the nurse to patient ratio is insane. Um, you know, as far as technology goes, I see a lot of these awesome nurses that are from my parents' generation and above, but we go from paper to electronic mandated by the government, but then there's no training that comes through as far as with getting these people antiquated to the electronic medical chart system or whatnot. Um, unfortunately, I've seen it on the job where if you don't just pick it up, then they'll fire, some, they'll fire you because you can't pick up that technology. Um, and I don't really like that because um, there should be, like you said, some continuing ed there to keep these people who have something amazing to offer in a, in a field, I'm just using mine as an example, mm -hmm. to, to continue forward because you can teach anybody anything and I'm a firm believer in that. So, um. Thank you for sharing that. And I, um, so th I think that's a good point of, um, how we often lose institutional knowledge, professional knowledge, professional wisdom, folks who have incredible experience in a field or in a setting who maybe lack of, of opportunity for educational development, we lose that. So that's a loss both for us and for them. Um, so I thank you for sharing that. It's a great point. Unless we have anything else, I want to jump on to our next question, though. Go ahead, Lori. Well, I was just going to add that uh, just agreeing with Mike that it, I think the responsibility isn't just with companies, but it is with educators as well. Mm -hmm. And if we look at the predictions of jobs that are emerging, they are uh, related to kind of analyzing all of this data that's coming from all of these machines and algorithms. And so um, uh, it's really up to uh, personal responsibility for people to get them themselves trained, but then ed educational institutions also have to, to re really be looking towards the future and saying, you know, this is what's coming, so how, how can we prepare students for this? And maybe even educate students that, that this is what, what is on the horizon. Yeah, so looking at particularly being in an educational institution, right, what we can do um, to help folks prepare for this, this reality that's coming. So thank you, Lori. Okay, so let's go on to our continuing our, our complex conversations here. 
So um, I think one of the interesting things that's come out with a lot of the new technology that's been developed, we're developing stuff so quickly right now that often stuff gets put out into the marketplace and there are unintended consequences. Um, you know, I think maybe folks saw this story. This was of a um, African employee um, at Facebook's headquarters, I believe in uh, either Kenya or Zimbabwe, um, who went to go use the uh, you know, soap dispenser in the men's room and discovered that it was calibrated such that people with dark skin would not trigger it. Um, and th if anybody's seen this video, this person, you know, they're moving their hand under, nothing happens. They put a white paper towel over their hand, put that under, and suddenly it works. And so one of these unintended consequences of, now it's not that the design team was intentionally racist or that the engineer who built this particular, you know, the sensor was, or was probably intentionally racist, but it highlighted a point of when there were only white people in the room doing the programming and designing this product, when it got onto the real world, there were suddenly problems. So I think as, so again, we're not seeing the AI uprising, but algorithms, how we program stuff, it's already having an impact on our daily lives. You know, I think of this of, okay, what if instead of being a soap dispenser, it was self-driving car? You know, what is the implication then? So as these machine, as our uh, machine intelligence and capabilities, as they continue to grow and expand and take on more roles in society, what are the safeguards or limits that we should be putting in place for these things to kind of try to mitigate to the extent we can these unintended consequences? Thoughts from uh, the audience? <laughs> Maybe, no, our panel? <laughs> well, I think clearly the, oh, I'm sorry. Clearly, Thank you, Mike. Clearly the safeguards and, and limits need to be there. And, and you're right, there are unintended consequences. I was thinking the exact thing. I was thinking things like plastic, not too long on 60 Minutes, they had a special on all the plastic that's in the ocean and, mm -hmm. and elsewhere, and it's just horrendous. And I'm sure when it first came out, what a wonderful invention and let's all jump on board and, and now it's like e gads you know what have we created the automobile might be seen in a visual you know the the, the combustion engine was such a great thing and helped uh, so many different industries um, um, smartphones now there's so much coming out about what is the or their negative unintended consequences of these phones and people that get addicted to stuff. So safeguards and limits, sure. Um, it's that commercial marketplace where people get to choose. I'm glad we have that, but sometimes it's rather short-sighted. Um, so yeah, I think that's a role of government is the safeguard and the limits to keep things, you know, protect the environment and keep people safe. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mike. Keely? And I would add privacy to that as well. Um, mm. I think there's a lot of concerns around privacy as everything is digitized. It's just so easy for that information to leak out, get out, both intentionally and unintentionally. And so I think privacy is another one of those big safeguards we have to look very mm. hard at. The legal system is really going to have to change. Being a former lawyer, I can say, oh, wow, some of the laws on the books right now never in a million years would have contemplated the things that we have every day now, mm -hmm. uh, even something as Alexa, um, you know, and Siri and all of that. And the privacy, say, you know, safeguards, you know, to what extent the law can legally require you to hand over the records of your Siri or your Alexa, or is that a protected somehow communication that you're having, so to speak, with yourself in some ways? So, you know, there's fascinating things around that. I think kind of on this larger scale, like what kind of checks should we put in place with the technology that we're going to be, um, th that we're going to be uh, creating and developing over the many years? You know, I, I will say I too been kind of doing some research and came across a great article that was actually a, a conversation, an interview with a, a gentleman named Daniel Holm, I think is how he pronounces it. But he is, he has like his, you know, bachelor's, master's and PhD in AI. Like that was all his thesis was all around that and he has his own company startup but he had some really interesting things and I thought I, they really resonated with me but this notion that we must embed our ethical behaviors whatever we consider those to be into these machines as we are programming and developing them but of course then that begs the question as humanity or you know you can say well the ethics here in the United States or the cultural norms in this area are this way but we have to pay attention to that. And yes, it may be different in different parts of the world, but in the, you know, we are one humanity and these applications are gonna be going all over the place. So, so how do we come together as humans 
and agree upon, well, what are the ethical safeguards that we put in? What are the cultural norms? So when we sell this machine in India, is it going to have to be programmed different than that same machine we sell in Japan? And um, those things are really important, but I think it also raises the level of what we have to think about as humans um, in terms of our ethics, and that's a big question. Mm -hmm. That's not something that you know you necessarily leave to the guy that's the programmer in the corner. I, <laughs> you know that is something we have to have a conversation around. So it's it's kind of goes along the lines with that human-centered design or, or customer-centered design approach, which is very very big now. I know many of you have probably heard about it, read about it, but it's that idea idea taken, you know, up a notch, I think. Thank you, Keely. I don't have anything to add. I think I think Mike and Keely have it covered. Okay. All right. Thanks, Lori. Yeah. And well, and uh, I want to kind of follow up on what Keely is sharing here. Um, so my previous role was with uh, a, a curriculum uh, person at UMKC and part of this conversations we were having there with their engineering school is how do we start incorporating professional ethics into uh, training like mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, computer software, computer sciences, getting to this idea of not that there weren't discussions of ethics before in those fields, certainly there were, but getting to this idea of how do we start incorporating professional ethics, not just into ourselves, but in our products, the way we approach those products, the way we develop things as teams. So this is a very pertinent conversation that's not just theoretical, but what educators and industry professionals are having this very real conversation right now of, okay, how do we adapt to this need of, of keeping um, ethics as part of the way that we approach our work? So yeah, I, thank you for highlighting that. And if the workforce designing that is not diverse, we're not going to get to that, the bottom of those questions. I mean, if, if, the, if it's all white people in a room designing this, you're never going to reach some of the ethical questions you need to reach if you have a diverse workforce. So that's another reason why we need to continue work mm -hmm. in that area. Yeah. And relatedly, um, folks who maybe on the internet you've seen um, in the last couple of months, you're suddenly on all of your favorite websites being asked to click again to say, yes, I accept your terms, or there's new disclosures on the bottom or top. That's a response here in the United States to changes in laws in Europe. So it gets to your point of we're in an increasingly global, interconnected world, so being thoughtful about not just how we approach ethics and, and our priorities, but how other places do, because we're responding to their needs too. So yeah, thank you. Okay, let's move on to our last conversation topic. And um, as a sci-fi nerd, if I couldn't throw out a Mr. Data reference, um, yeah, it would have been a sad day for me. So thank you for that. Um, but looking at um, uh, specifically, Dr. Mc uh, McAfee talked about like this idea of androids becoming a part of our regular life. Um, and this is a little more maybe what if than some of our other questions. But um, I think it's worth addressing. Um, when I started thinking about this concept of androids, people that we interact with, I thought about um, whenever I have to call like my doctor's office or the bank and I spend 15 minutes on the phone with an automated voice, you know, someone who sounds very pleasant and repeats the same 10 things. You know, I think of, okay, how do I respond to that? What if that was suddenly someone, uh, someone standing in front of me now? What if instead of it's just on the phone, this is sort of what's handling maybe reception uh, at some of our um, uh, businesses? We're already seeing places where you no longer talk to a person. You just check in at a desk, press some buttons, and hope somebody knows you're there. Um, so I wonder what's the implication here as we add more, uh, as machines start to look more and more like us, um, is it concerning? the way that we sometimes react to human machines that we know aren't quite human. I kind of wonder if maybe there's an ethical question there. I wonder if our panel has any thoughts. You started to make noises, Mike, uh, so I don't know if that means you have Well, I had a very sarcastic that. thought, and that was, oh, it's probably going to be another protected class. Oh, no, I wrote that. Are we creating a lesser race? I mean, I just sat there, you know, if you're really going to go out there mm -hmm. with it. I think there's both, both really cool ideas that you can interact with something that's humanoid or, you know, mm -hmm. but then there's some real problematic uh, ideas around anthropomorphizing mm -hmm. technology. And that's what this is. And, you know, and I think when we do that as humans, we may tend to overestimate the value because we're humanizing them in a way that we're placing them at the same level as human intellect, human capabilities. Mm -hmm. And I think that's grossly, at least right now, overestimating the capabilities of, of that human-like computer that's sitting there. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, but um, then again, does it, does, does it place greater fear in us as, as a human race? Because you see this as a human-looking robot. Does that 
create more fear for us that they're going to take over our jobs and take over mm -hmm. because they look like us as opposed to that computer in the corner that just is in a box. Mm -hmm. I don't, those are just some of the yeah. things I was thinking about. But what are you thinking? That's a crazy fun Well, question. I was thinking, yes, it <laughs> could be a little creepy uh, <laughs> that looking at uh, a robot that looks like me, um, not specifically me, but maybe as a human. <laughs> um, I also think too about not just the image of the machine, but even machines that are doing things that you think only humans should be doing and what's the implication mm. of that. And I can't remember what it was that I was listening to. Um, some podcast or something where they were talking about how I think it was some psychologist had created this program where um, people could talk to it and tell them their problems and the the pro the uh, program was created so there, w there was an algorithm so that this uh, robot would respond and um, the person's secretary who had been using it really liked it and when when it was this kind of prototype was taken away said oh you know that really helped me and so i think thinking about the implications of those things as well as is, is important because she found it very useful and you know for someone to be able to talk to a, a robot about their problems and and that they are able to feel better after that that's good mm -hmm. but then what are the ethical implications as well um, if that person has spirit some very serious problems um, you know do, we don't want them to think that this is your only solution and mm -hmm. so um, looking at those safeguards I don't have a solution to that but things to consider mm -hmm. yeah thank you for sharing that and as someone going to graduate school to become a therapist I uh, you know thought I was fairly safe from the robots in this job but uh, no that's a good point though and, and it's um, something that um, yeah I, I think it gets to maybe what we talked about earlier about where is there um, a chance for humans and, and machines to be working alongside towards a similar goal um, you know in that situation does it become important if a person realizes they're not they're talking to a robot you know, those kind of situations. Have you ever had a moment where you thought maybe you were engaging with a human being at the other end of a text line or something? You were chatting and realized, oh, this is an automated service. You know, what does that do? Um, so, yeah, interesting opportunities, but also, um, again, as kind of the theme of the day, it seems like there's uh, opportunities and challenges here as well. Do we have any other thoughts, comments? I, just, I think about the same, the same, I've heard this a lot lately, like with these kinds of technologies that we're gonna have to be able to fail quickly and, and recover quickly. So mm -hmm. a lot of, um, even with education, students, is, we may try programs or, or try to train people certain ways and it fails quickly. And mm -hmm. then you're able to go, oh, that didn't work. And then you, you adapt and move. So mm -hmm. your themes of adaptability and being able, in teaching people that you're, you may have the same awkward interaction with a robot that you do with a human being. You know, I, I do that all the time, is that you may have conflict in, in, with humans, and you may have that same parallel kind of conflict in, in awkwardness or, or uh, unintended consequences with, with human that mm -hmm. you do with an android. And that that might fail, or it might not go exactly like you planned, but being able to then recover and adapt mm -hmm. is really mm -hmm. kind of a fascinating part of it to me. Mm -hmm. And I, I think you make an interesting, that idea of adapting quickly, fail quickly and adapt. And I wonder about, I think about our legal structures. I think about us as higher ed. Um, you know, I always joke, we we corner like a freight train here in higher ed. We don't change quickly. And so, yeah, figuring out. And community colleges are even faster than our universities. So <laughs> Yes, that, and yes, community yeah. colleges are. Yes, this is true. I've worked at both. Um, but our legal system is the same way. It doesn't change quickly, yeah. right? And in some ways, that's good because you don't necessarily want things to, you know, our laws and our structures to change but figuring out how to balance being adaptive and responsive um, with the structure we already have. Uh, another, we've identified many challenges today, so I, I think, but uh, some good conversation too. Other thoughts before we wrap up? You have to be a life learner. Mm -hmm. That's from the wise words of my now past grandmother who was, you have to be a life learner. Mm -hmm. And that's from an old school generation, as you have to continually keep reading and keep learning, it never stops. I think that's an interesting point, though, of that's kind of always been true, though, hasn't it? I mean, ideally, we're always learning, so now it's just learning about new things. So maybe it hasn't changed as much as we thought in some ways. Yeah. 
I think that's a good place to end. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you, everybody, unless I missed a comment here. OK, all right. Well, thank you. Oh. Mm -hmm. The first, I don't know if you've seen it yet, the first journalist robot um, made its way. So um, it just released a published. Of, you know, published. Interesting. So, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll also want to take a second to invite everybody to next month's conversation on uh, Thursday the 4th next month. We're going to be talking about sustainable development. So we hope you'll join us for that conversation. Thank you everybody for being here today. And thank you again, especially to our expert panel. A quick round of applause for our panel. Thank you for being here.